Okay, so this is a lecture for the Motor Control Skill Acquisition Unit and this time we're looking at pathology in relation to motor control. In particular what this really means is what we've learned about the way we produce movements from damage that's occurred to the brain in different ways. So it could have been through trauma or through strokes or through particular diseases. These often tell us about how the brain works because once that function is removed it begins to tell us what was happening before the injury occurred. So uh, unfortunately over the course of history uh, many people have had different types of brain injury and each time we get to learn a little bit about what the brain was doing. You need to be careful though because there's this idea that particular parts of the brain do particular things and very often that's uh, potentially quite misleading because it relies on um, some big assumptions. If we use brain imaging we often have to apply filters ourselves that allow us to see the bit that we think is active appearing more active than the rest and that can be a problem and with these brain damage injuries you get some patients who appear to show a perfect pattern of, of injury causing a loss of function and then you get some patients with a very similar injury uh, with much less of an issue and it may appear that other parts of the brain were taking on aspects of the role and you only really find that out um, uh, when the injuries have occurred and you get to have a look at a brain that's been damaged in some way and can compare different similar injuries and of course you rarely get two identical uh, injuries between two different people. I'm going to start by talking about Phineas Gage which is really the, the famous case of brain injury uh, leading us to believe that the brain, particular parts of the brain, do particular jobs. We'll then go through the peripheral system and just look at a couple of disorders that can affect the periphery, work our way up through the spinal cord and the central nervous system into the basal ganglia, the cerebellum, and ultimately cortical disorders, the highest level of function that we have really in our brain. So that's going to be the story, and in each case it's going to be just signposting some of the issues. To a large extent, the way this unit is assessed at second year level, you won't need uh, extensive knowledge. Um, most of what we're going to cover here may be enough to get you through but if you choose to go and write about things like this in more detail, then of course you'll have to back it up with much more uh, reading, at least textbooks. And as always, I recommend you go and find journal articles that have looked at particular cases in sufficient detail. So, Phineas Gage, very famous case. Uh, a man who was working on a railway and was his job was to push dynamite down into the holes and then usually walk away and leave it till it exploded uh, and as you can see from the image in the background there is a image of a, a spike effectively traveling through a man's head and that's what happened to Phineas he pressed down on the tamping iron too hard set the dynamite off and as he was leaning forwards the spike was propelled directly through his head and for most people that would be more than enough to kill them but for Phineas Gage was very lucky in some respects. He did lose an eye, he did lose some teeth, and he lost a big chunk of skull that was, I guess, never found again. And the, eye, the tamping iron was found quite a long way away from where the incident occurred. Because of the speed at which the injury happened, it was assumed it might have been quite a clean injury. But actually, as we've managed to progress on, we, it looks like it may not have been that clean, and it may have never become infected. The doctor who examined him, first doctor on the scene, I noticed the wound upon the head before I alighted from my carriage, it obviously made a lot of damage to him. The pulsation of the brain being very distinct, Mr Gage during the time I was examining this wound was relating to the manner in which he was injured. He was telling people around him how it had happened. I did not believe Mr Gage's statement at the time, I thought he was deceived. Mr Gage persisted in saying that the bar went through his head. Mr Gage got up and vomited and the effort of vomiting pressed out and another bit of brain that had obviously been separated from the rest and that fell on the floor. So it's a pretty gruesome uh, situation. But Phineas Gage lived through this and survived to quite some time. However, people believed that his personality was changed substantially as a result. So here's a little statement from a different doctor and you can see there that's a picture of him and his eye was lost in the incident. The equilibrium or balance between his intellectual faculties and animal propensities seemed to have been destroyed. His fitful, irrelevant, irreverent even, indulging at times and in the grossest profanity, swearing a lot. And that was not previously his 
custom. He showed little deference to his fellows, little respect, was very impatient of being restrained or confined if it conflicted with what he wanted to do at that point in time. Uh, and he would devise all sorts of different plans for future operations and clever ideas and then abandon them very quickly. So intellectually he was considered to be quite childish and he had these strong passions and urges and impulses that he was no longer controlling, he was just doing what he felt like straight away. And this behaviour began, began to point to the idea that perhaps the frontal lobe is responsible for forming and persisting with these plans and actually uh, carrying them out and actually controlling the more sort of primal urges that people have and uh, trying to find the appropriate outlet for them. And of course just controlling our behaviour in terms of swearing and, and outbursts and anger and things like that. So previous to his injury, although untrained in school, he possessed a well-balanced mind and was looked upon by those who knew him as shrewd and smart as a businessman. In this regard, his mind was radically changed, so decidedly that his friends and acquaintances no longer saw Gage. Very famous case, as I say, we believed for a while that it was clear evidence of uh, specific damage just because of the sheer speed that that tamping iron went through his, his head. However, as that previous slide has shown us, there was some sort of imprecise damage and of course it's just going to be a pretty blunt instrument ripping through flesh and that's not going to make a nice clean incision particularly. And then we believe it probably became gangrenous and that would have caused other issues and so the infection may also have caused additional damage. So on the one hand you can find a story that says it's nice and clear, the frontal lobe just does personality and planning and control, high level control, but actually that might not be completely the case and there are certainly instances of exceptions to these rules because he lived for quite some time afterwards and uh, occasionally it wasn't as clear cut as this story denotes. So that's where it all began. That's where the interest in looking at how brains break and what that means really began. So now we'll begin our journey up through the periphery of the body into the central nervous system and up through the brain. And really, if we're looking at um, nerve damage occurring in the periphery, we're looking at things like multiple sclerosis, motor neuron disease. So these are disruptions to the way that signals are transmitted through our nervous system, either to the muscles or on the way back to the spinal cord and up to the brain. Multiple sclerosis is a degenerative disorder and it's uh, the myelin sheath around the axons that convey the, the impulses that's damaged and it starts to disintegrate. So they're no longer protected and the signals can no longer travel those distances at those speeds so you just lose a lot of the information, it never arrives or it arrives at the wrong time and is ignored. So it's very disruptive. The problem is it occurs in a reasonably random order. So you'll see small signs beginning and then they kind of creep in and uh, you can sort of see it coming. And one of the worst things here is that it often leaves aspects of kind of higher level functioning reasonably untouched. So these little elements of damage to the axons are called sclerosis and of course they just gradually progress. Um, and there's not an awful lot yet that we can do to prevent this, but that's telling us of course that those nerves and those just the sheath around the nerve is performing a vital function. We believe it's caused by either an identified virus or autoimmune disease where the body effectively self-destructs, which of course can be triggered by viruses as well. So it's difficult to unpick and I'm sure we could go and look very particularly at the research we are up to, but all I'm doing is just giving you an oversight of what the options are and what they tell us about how motor control was being produced prior to the damage. Motor neuron disease captures quite a range of different types of dis uh, disorder. They have different names and uh, it's the disease which effectively triggered the ice bucket challenge a little while ago. So if you did pour a bucket of ice over your head, this is the disease you were raising money for, or at least to try and research how to cure it or prevent it. It's a 
cluster of different progressions and different symptomatologies, but ultimately the motor neurons that reside in the spinal cord uh, begin to degenerate. And so again, you end up with a very well preserved cognition and the person can be completely themselves, except they're trapped in a body that no longer works. And when you are able to look at the neurons after, the, after they've been removed, or if you can take them out without causing any damage, I guess, you sometimes get to see that the cell damage has occurred, and of course, usually you can just uh, take these neurons from other animals in, in the lab instead. In humans, the symptoms generally start to present in later life. However, um, some of the more um, unpleasant versions of a neuro disease can affect us much earlier in life, and that's particularly unpleasant. You'll see progressive weakness, uh, muscle wasting, because the muscles aren't being stimulated properly, um, disorganized muscle twitching, and then gradual sort of um, stiffening of the arms and legs. Um, and that can even cause additional problems because you can start to see people, for example, digging uh, the fingernails into their palms and things like that. So again, a particularly uh, unpleasant disease, um, and it tells us that the motor neurons fairly predictably are performing a very important role in producing movements. Unfortunately, again, it, it's, there's some similarities in how it progresses, but it's also not consistent enough to say uh, exactly the same each, each time, and, and therefore it makes it difficult to, to track and trace. Progressing up, we can move and look at the basal ganglia, which is uh, that area in the core of the brain which appears to be uh, a bit of a relay station where most signals between the upper cortex and the rest of the body will be processed. And there appears to be a kind of cycling of information so that uh, it's just continually uh, present in the basal ganglia when it's being uh, processed. There's big deposits of uh, dopamine in there which uh, cause a darker coloration, so not just grey matter, but they actually call it substantia nigra, i.e. black matter. Two diseases that appear to affect that area would be Parkinson's and Huntington's. One appears to make you shake most of the time and then be unable to produce the movements you want, and the other, Huntington's, appears to make you uh, the opposite of shaking, kind of completely paralysed, um, apart from these completely involuntary and slightly odd movements sometimes, slightly pronounced uh, movements. But it shows that that area can degenerate in different ways and it obviously shows that area is performing a really important role in regulating our movements, either keeping us controlled and still or helping us to initiate movements and we'll just review that quickly. So in Huntington's, proteins build up in the nerve cells, causing the death of particular brain cells. It's obviously a wide-ranging disease, it affects a number of areas. Involuntary movements is a key part of it. And as it progresses, you obviously progress to relative paralysis, but of course, not in its fullest sense. It's still capable of movement, it's just hard to actually organise them. You get memory loss and the behaviour gradually Degenerates and it's a reasonably unpleasant um, progression of events. So that's one way in which we know that the basal ganglia are regulating our ability to move in a voluntary, planned way. And if you take away memory as well, then you start to end up with a system that is obviously not able to work properly anymore. Parkinson's perhaps receives more attention. I, I imagine it might be more common because it or easier to research, but it gets written about more, I, I believe. Characterised by shaking, particularly of the hands, and that then progresses to other parts of the body. And when we're able to examine the basal ganglia, you see a reduction in the level of dopamine. So as it progresses, you can see less than 10% of the normal level of dopamine. And so one of the treatments is to actually try and insert electrodes that stimulate further dopamine production or you can even inject or give drugs that stimulate dopamine production to try and make up for this shortfall. And it suggests to us that that presence of dopamine in the basal ganglia is performing an important role in helping us to inhibit unnecessary movements. If you imagine a, 
really detailed, complex system of billions of wires all interconnected. What you would imagine would be all sorts of background noise just constantly buzzing. And if that was manifesting in our movements, we would see a shake and it would be relatively uncontrollable. So one of the roles that the basic ganglia appear to produce, it appear to perform, is to prevent that from happening. And most of our movements are just the desired necessary movements. And as they deteriorate, these movements creep in. And another interesting aspect, albeit very unpleasant, is that Parkinson sufferers often cannot, um, or increasingly cannot, perform the movements they want to. So there was a documentary a, a little while ago where people simply couldn't walk through doors anymore. The door was open, there was nothing stopping them, but they'd forgotten how to walk through doors. And it was, the guy was able to explain very clearly how frustrating it was. Um, and in the end, he was resorting to, for example, there was something completely different. So perfectly normal behaviour had just gone and was no longer able to be initiated. And instead, he had to crawl on his hands and knees through the doorway because that was a new movement that he could somehow produce. But it, recalling an old movement was just not possible anymore. So simple things can be taken away from you. And it tells us that the basal ganglia is performing a really important role at the very core of producing our movements. Working our way up to the cortex and considering strokes and tics and Tourette syndrome. Each of these, well, strokes in particular can be quite non-specific. And what we mean by strokes, there's really two main types. You either, um, what people often think of is a blood clot blocking an artery. And preferably, uh, usually that will make its way through eventually, but if it's lodged for long enough, then the area downstream from that can lose oxygen for too long and die. So that would be one type of stroke called an ischemic stroke. Probably much worse, um, but still treatable, is a hemorrhagic stroke where you actually bleed inside your brain. And of course that isn't the normal condition, so the cells in that affected area can't function the same. If it's a bad bleed, you can build up pressure and that can damage the cells in the area. So that's much harder to treat, and that's why often we, well, in both cases actually, we recommend fast treatment as fast as possible and get people looked after quickly. Problem is, they're relatively nondescript. The way the, the blood progresses through a brain is not uh, particularly planned in relation to what functions each part of the brain performs. So when uh, these blood clots do make it through, or when the bleeds happen, or, you know, we get dissections and bleeds. It's not a targeted specific area, why would it be? So actually sometimes it's not that easy to study the effects of strokes because they've affected a, a couple of functions or a couple of areas that overlapped in our sort of clean you know, way of thinking about it. We like to think that oh, that area does one thing and that area does something else. Well, strokes aren't worried about that. They'll just damage whichever area is damaged. So. You, it's very difficult to study. Unfortunately, it's reasonably prevalent as we uh, become sort of able to age to a older life expectancy. Stroke, things like strokes become more common and equally with our particular diet, we don't tend to keep ourselves in very good shape. So we are more prone to high blood pressure and fatty buildups. And so strokes do happen, but they can be messy. So it's not a simple thing of saying, well, they always cause the same problem. With ticks, we see these um, areas of the brain that appear to be damaged and perhaps overfiring, and then that can progress to if it's affecting uh, your ability to verbalize and vocalize, it might start to become Tourette syndrome. So you have these arteries running into the brain, and unfortunately, the brain is particularly sensitive to loss of blood, be it through uh, ischemic stroke or through uh, damage and bleeding. So whatever happens downstream of that blockage or around the area of the bleed, uh, that's where we're going to see problems, but unfortunately it can be very non-specific. One issue that you can see following a stroke, in a particular instance of damage to the temporal lobe, which could be caused by a stroke, it could also be caused by trauma, and it can sometimes be something that just happens uh, as a developmental defect in the way people are born in genetics, basically, that you can see something called a praxia. 
in particular most people that would be in the left temporal lobe up here and it means that people forget um, how to interpret and how to understand movements which is quite relevant to what we're talking about so if you think about the temporal lobes being something where we often store basic uh, memory and recognition of, of what things are damage there in particular damage to the area that looks at recognizing a movement or a context which might stimulate a movement that's pretty important so apraxia is disorder of motor planning which may be acquired as a developmental defect or it may be acquired um, but it may not be caused by simple lack of coordination or um, sensory loss or just failure to comprehend what's being asked of you. So it's more specific, it's the, the actual ability to draw upon our memory of how movement should be and how it should be performed can be lost. And that's quite interesting, just a particular part of the brain that can be damaged and therefore reduce our ability to simply understand what is meant. You know, it's one of those things where if someone used a word you hadn't heard before you might not know what to do or what they were saying and in some ways that's how apraxia might feel. You just have no ability to form that movement. You, you, might, you might understand the instruction but not actually what it means. Carrying on looking at uh, different types of brain damage in the cortical area we have these tics, brief, repetitive and seemingly purposeless actions that may involve one muscle or a group of muscles. You can have tics that are primary and they usually mean that they're sort of the main one that might set off other tics. And they can be transient as in something which comes and goes quite briefly or chronic which affects you for a long time. There are instances where you know people have had quite noticeable tics um, and of course in some things like games like poker you might even look for people who have a tick it might indicate that they're lying or you know, bluffing or something they can be chronic which means fast and you know, one-off quite quick or they can be dystonic and therefore sustained and perhaps more unpleasant that could be quite painful and somewhere between the cortex and the basal ganglia you can usually see that that's where some some damage has occurred. And again, it's something that we're unable to um, inhibit. So there's a movement that doesn't need to happen, it's not intentional, and we're unable to inhibit that movement, so it happens. And it could be because the cortex has fired at the wrong time, but that may have been caught by the basal ganglia. So somewhere in that relationship, we expect there to be a problem. Now that can also then progress to Tourette's syndrome. So it's a form of tick. Um, but it affects our vocalizations as well. It's fairly rare, but of course we hear about it quite a lot because it's very noticeable, so it's, it'll be on TV and you'll, you'll see stories about Tourette's. The actual mechanism as to why it tends to progress from guttural noises to fully-fledged swear words is, is quite poorly understood, but it does appear to be this evolution, and if you catch people in the early stages, they may be less prone to swearing, and then for some reason, swearing appears to become part of it. Uh, and there are you know, interesting theories as to why that might be. So um, there have been some studies showing that people who are able, allowed to swear rather than simply uh, have controlled outbursts actually feel a lot better afterwards, not just in Tourette's, but in general life. So it may be that it's allowing us to you know, release a little bit of emotional steam, so to speak. But again, it would be usually some overactivity in the cortex which is not then inhibited properly in the basal ganglia and so it becomes a fully fledged in this case movement but verbalization you also see um, this is probably less damage to the brain but you see other other interesting phenomena so you might see phantom limb syndrome where people who've had a limb removed, for example, because it was injured or because of cancer or in war situations, um, they still feel that the limb is there. So the explanation would be that there's still a large chunk of your cortex devoted to controlling and sensing that limb, which is now redundant. 
so it can play up. If there's no input coming in to tell you where that limb actually is or what it's actually doing, any signals that you know, happen to be passing through or happen to be um, building up, they, they just progress uncontrolled. So it can feel like the limb is still there. What off people often describe is um, if you have the area of the brain that is controlling it, gradually it should be replaced by other functions. So they actually, because you have neuroplasticity, so you actually often hear people describing it as the limb feels like it's shrinking, which is kind of haunting and odd, but yeah, it feels like they still definitely have a limb, it's definitely there, and as over time it can feel like it's shrinking. Upsettingly, it can also feel very painful, so it can feel like it's on fire, it can feel like it's itching and tingling, and of course it isn't there. So there's nothing you can do about it. You can't scratch that itch. So it can be very unpleasant. And uh, these are the studies by Gazaniga in uh, California, I think, who was able to um, use mirror boxes to show people the other hand. And that would allow them to feel like they had control again and gain that sensory feedback. So they could, for example, if the phantom limb had gone into a clenched fist, they could actually unclench it by looking at a mirror on their lap of the other hand and it would of course look like the correct hand was unclenching and it apparently caused immediate and very profound relief to that unpleasant sensation. So it's very interesting that our brain can play such compelling and convincing tricks on us, in this case given that the, the affected limb simply isn't there. So if we progress to another famous case, we'll top and tail with, with famous cases, Phineas Gage and now patient HM. He recently died uh, and so we can name him as Henry Meliason and he had a, a very unfortunate uh, case of epilepsy which was quite severe and the proposed treatment, it was pretty much a guess, but the proposed treatment was to remove his hippocampus. It was actually done using a straw effectively so it was a, a metal straw, they went, they dug down as far as they could and then literally sucked out that piece of brain once they'd found it. So um, pretty gruesome and pretty kind of heavy handed. You probably couldn't get ethics for this and you wouldn't uh, keep your license for doing it in the current day and age. But his epilepsy was quite profound and it was uh, one way of attempting to cure it. So the hippocampus is the main region that was taken and of course we're quite imprecise with these things. It's a, a knife in a soft gooey brain so some other bits might have been taken. What happened to him was that he was no longer able to form new memories. So as he progressed and aged, he did not recognise himself in the mirror. He could have a conversation with you and forget that he'd had it five minutes later. Effectively, his ability to form explicit, conscious memories was taken away. He could remember older events, and in effect, he expected to look and for the news on TV to be familiar, but it never was for the rest of his life. Everything that had happened was a surprise. And some other patients have had similar issues, not necessarily by having this operation, but there are other ways of experiencing this, this syndrome. Interestingly though, he did the mirror drawing task that we did in our labs, and he became extremely good at it, so he was forming some kind of memory, but he never recalled ever having done that task. As a result, he effectively made a living from travelling around being in people's experiments, because he couldn't form new memories, but there were other things that were preserved and he could remember some stuff. So that's the story of HM and again tells us an important function of a particular part of the brain which is that effectively the hippocampus is the indexing system for new memories. And of course once they're lodged then it's less important. Progressing on to look at um, two particular areas that have been closely associated with language. And the theory has been, it's not always perfect fit, that one of them appears to control uh, our ability to find the right word and our nouns, and one of them appears to 
regulate our grammar and the way we structure sentences. So that they're usually on the left-hand side of the brain, uh, and they're named after the people who first kind of discovered the, the syndrome through which it occurred. So if we have an example of what's called Wernicke's aphasia, the doctor might say, tell me where you live, to which the patient might say, uh, well, it's a Minder place, uh, two, he has two of them, uh, for dreaming and Pinda and supper, uh, up and down, four of down, three of up. Um, and so what you see is this kind of pattern of what looks like, in this case, quite sort of familiar sounding language, but there's obviously something missing. So what's the weather like today? Fully under the gym jam and on the alti grabber. You know, that's, that's obviously some gibberish and so there's some new words being inserted where there should be nouns. There should be formal words in those places. So what's broken in Wernicke's aphasia would appear to be the ability to find the right words in memory. And if we go back and look at where the damage has occurred in Wernicke's aphasia, it's around the temporal lobe area, which is usually responsible for forming different types of recognition memory and knowing what things are and what they mean. So if that's lost, you no longer have the right nouns to describe things. A longer sample, uh, what brought you to the hospital? Uh, is this some of the work that we, as we did before, or right from when uh, I'm here, what's wrong with me because I was myself and then the tons took something and the time between me and my regular time. It kind of sounds like language, but there's no information being conveyed. It's kind of just the grammatical stuff with no content. Very hard to know what the person is saying, despite them talking for a few, good few sustained moments there. Not a lot of information coming through. And that's symptomatic of Wernicke's aphasia, where the content is lost because that part of the memory to give you the right words is missing. And there are some examples here in your slides that you can follow through and watch on YouTube. I can't play those on here because I'll be done for copyright. So if we look at Broca's aphasia instead, it's a different pattern. And if you are to describe this scene, you might say, what's just going on? It might make sense. There's a child trying to reach in the cookie jar uh, and give a cookie to his sister, but the stool he's on is falling over, so he's going to fall down. And maybe the sister is finding this all quite funny. There's a woman washing uh, dishes in the sink, but the sink's overflowing. So it's just a reasonably normal description, I hope. I hope I haven't demonstrated any unusual linguistic signs there, apart from my English accent. However, a broker's patient might describe it as follows. Kid, uh, cookie, uh, candy, well, I don't know, but it's writ, uh, easy does it, slam, early fall, men, many, no, girl. And so again, what we're seeing here is that the correct nouns are being used, but there's no grammar. There's no connection, and you don't know who's doing what to whom. So that would appear to mean that the kind of planning and sense-making aspect, which is more forwards in the brain, that's what's been damaged in Broca's aphasia. It's kind of interesting because Broca's aphasia was first identified in a patient called Tom in France. And he was called Tom because when they found him, that's all he could say. Um, and it was actually caused by syphilis and that can damage the brain. And they kept his brain, and it's still on display in a museum in France. But that isn't quite what we're seeing here. So Broca identified that, that part of the brain was damaged, and then this whole syndrome effectively was named after him. Although, uh, of course, this is quite different to someone who can only say the word Tom. So, as you can see here, there's this time the words are correct, but the grammar's missing. And with Wernicke's aphasia, the grammar was correct, but the words were missing. And in both cases, something very important is lost, because you can't really tell what's going on in either case. 
So another example might be uh, mother, dad, no mother, dishes, uh, running, water, floor. Again, nouns, but no grammar. And there's an example. Again, you can click through and watch or listen on YouTube. So that sounds like a lot of ways the brain can break, but what else is left? We could we could go on, but we're not going to. There's a disorder called prosopagnosia, where people uh, are unable to recognise faces, uh, and so everyone begins to look the same, and they can't recognise family and friends. And in one case, uh, a person famously mistook his wife's head or face for a football and kicked her, and caused quite a lot of damage. And I think a film was made about it. And yeah, should you face criminal charges in that situation, it's difficult uh, to, to get right. And again, that would be caused by damaging the temporal lobe, which is storing your recognition of, of where things should be, or you know what objects are, in this case, faces. There's a disorder called blind sight, where people are convinced that they can't see, and they have no conscious uh, awareness of being able to see. But if you insist that they try and navigate through a room, they will hit nothing in the room. And if you hold a number of fingers up and ask them to guess, of course, they will complain that they can't see. But if you say, well, please just guess, they will be right most of the time. So that was called blind sight because the person effectively can see. And that would suggest there's some kind of problem uh, around the area at the back occipital lobe. And in particular, there's an area called V1 where vision processing occurs, and that either is damaged and not doing the processing or it's not passing the information on to the rest of the brain. Weirdly there are other pathways that our brain can transmit the information through but it won't be as good. So it could be that there's no conscious awareness of the sophisticated technicolor vision that you and I see. However, there might be enough for people to make best guesses and that would appear to be a sort of uh, something which you can see in the bird brain and the reptile brain and we still have some ability to do that. There's a disease called neglect, where people are able to see completely fine, but simply fail to pay attention to usually half of the visual space. And that can be quite damaging, so it's just that you cannot pay attention properly. And you know, we've talked about attention in our lectures, and so imagine if you simply couldn't use it properly and you would miss important things. You see people, for example, who uh, just leave the oven on or leave the gas on and uh, fail to see things coming and have accidents on that side more often. And again, it tells us something very important about the way the brain's working and how information is being processed. In the case of neglect, as I recall, we're looking at the parietal cortex, the back at the top, which actually connects what you have, the result of what you're seeing, with what it really means and what to do about it. So, on a particular side, our brain is usually wired up so that whichever hemisphere of the brain controls the opposite side, it would mean that if you ignore the right hand side of your vision, the left hand side of your brain around the parietal uh, lobe would probably indicate some damage. Then we have something called a commissurectomy, where the brain is effectively divided in two. There's a corpus callosum running through the middle of the brain, which is almost entirely white fibres, so it's just sending information, there's not a lot of um, grey matter. And that's very important for transferring information from one side to the other. We do it reasonably often, a lot. It was suggested as a treatment for epilepsy to prevent the noisy signal progressing to the other side of the brain, and it seems to be a sort of a reasonable attempt to fix it. It reduces the symptoms in most people. However, there are some interesting uh, byproducts. So, for most of us, our kind of ability to reason and speak originates in the left-hand side of our brain. However, it turns out the right-hand side of our brain, for most people, is capable of, of taking in written information. So if we flashed information up on the left, and therefore the right-hand side of the brain processed it, it's only there for a split second so you haven't got time to adjust your gaze, only the right-hand side of the brain held that information and it cannot send it across. So if you flashed up commands 
to that side, the right hand side of the brain would often obey the command. So they might say laugh or drink. These are quite famous examples. And the people would often burst out laughing or get up and go for a drink in the middle of the experiment. And the reasoning was the left hand side of the brain, where we're consciously speaking from, couldn't know the actual reason to the why they just did that. But they would be stopped and say, well, why did you just laugh? Or why did you just go down the hallway for a drink? So without any information, we would find that the left-hand side of the brain would make up an answer. They would say, ah, oh, well, you know, you guys have this stupid job doing this all day. That's why I'm laughing. Or, well, I was thirsty and this is boring, so I went for a drink. And that isn't the reason they got up. They got up because the, the screen told them to. So there's something very interesting in that. And it just tells us, begins to give us a little bit of insight into how the brain's working. There are many more ways of the brain breaking, and each one can tell us something important about how it works. But of course, as we've seen, some of them are too messy, and therefore we can't usually draw firm conclusions. Rehabilitation is extremely hard to talk about at the general level because it depends what caused the impairment and how reversible it is, and in many cases with brains, healing is not an easy option. The damage we see could be natural from ageing, it could be genetic. We do see uh, brain trauma, in particular in young men who uh, drive cars too fast and get too near golf clubs or get in too many fights. So it can happen. And of course we've seen illnesses as well, and they're usually generative and therefore not easy to do much about. However, we can try and preserve some function and slow the decline in those cases. The problem is that many of these are typical ways of the brain breaking and so it begins to raise the question of well is this abnormal or just another version of normal if it happens to enough people it turns out it's quite common. So is our definition of normal perhaps too narrow would be the question to reflect on perhaps if, if all of these things are quite typical and perfectly possible responses of the brain to whatever happens, and if they're a natural result of ageing, for example, shouldn't that be classified as normal movement? It's worth contemplating. So that's the end of that one, and I hope uh, it's interesting. And obviously the contents of this could be assessed in the exam, and uh, so make sure you're familiar with it. Thanks for now.